church family, we invite you to stand and sing with us. Let's bless the name of the Lord today. Blessed be our name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. everybody good morning did you guys have fun last night okay last night was Brian's birthday so that's what I meant all right two, uh, 54 okay good morning everybody before we continue on our worship this morning we want to welcome you uh, this morning thank you again for coming into the house of the Lord this morning and praise and honor him this morning amen also, if you are visiting with us for the first time, we want to welcome you as well. Thank you so much for coming. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to go to the, the back. Those guys are standing right there to receive your gift from us and to fill up that connection card for us. All right, we continue on our series in the book of James, The Danger of Greed. You will hear from Brian later on. But we have one question for you, and that question is on the screen. Let's take a look. If you were given $10 million right now, just right now, what would you do with it? Just right now. All right, our visitors, please go to the back to receive that gift from us. And for the rest of us, please turn to the person right next to you and ask that question. May God bless you all.
Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious are always open for us. We thank you for your love and your forgiveness and your faithfulness. Amen. Does everyone know that our church is really amazing? I mean, I mean, our church is amazing. And what makes our church amazing is every single one here. And, um, and I just want you to know, like from Kaz and I, you know, being uprooted from um, the slums of Southern California to paradise of Hawaii, you know, that was a big transition. But just over the last nine months, the love we've received from, from all of you, and um, it truly is Oh, uh, this has been our Ohana now, and uh, I just, we were just reflecting on that, and, and Kaz and I couldn't be more happier to, to be here, and our kids love it, and so thank you for being an amazing church, and for loving and accepting us, like it's, it's, it's a blessing. So, um, we have a bunch of stuff going on at church, I mean like, like it's amazing, like in your programs, you have this fancy green card. I mean, this is, this is fancy, high-tech stuff. Uh, so we just want, like, th this is like our save the date of, like, all the big stuff coming up. And, uh, you know, next week we have Los Angeles Lakers chaplain uh, Rick Harville speaking. Uh, well, he's uh, 
the former chaplain as of like two years ago, but he was there the Showtime era. He was there with the three P with the Kobe and Gasol and, and, and all that stuff. So uh, he's speaking next week. Um, and then we have Vacation Bible School. Man, it's going to be epic. And, um, and so get your kids, grandkids, neighbors, and um, stray kids all signed up for that. <laughs> Some of the things that come to my mind, I'm just telling you. And then we have the Ron and D. Hall Arnold Dedication Potluck on Sunday, July 28th. That's going to be special, so make sure you mark your calendars for that. Then we have uh, two big events coming up. We have a men's uh, uh, kickoff breakfast with former uh, professional football player Jeff Kemp, and well as he's also doing a marriage enrichment event and uh, called the Ultimate Team on Sunday. So we had the breakfast on Saturday, August 17th, and that same day uh, the Rams are playing the... Um, Cowboys. And who's going to win? Cowboys. Cowboys. Okay. I go with the majority and the loudest. So Cowboys. All right. So, uh, uh, and then that Sunday after that, the 18th from 3 to 6, a marriage arrangement event. So that's a save the date. Um, things going on. You'll be hearing more about that. But the lots of great things are going on. Now, we're in the series of James called Act of Faith. And we've encouraged everyone to read the book of James, Monday through Friday. And I know every single one of us have read it. Raise your hand if you've read it. All right, nice. Raise your hand if you haven't read it. No, I'm just kidding. I won't do that to you. <laughs> now, now uh, uh, yesterday and today, um, there was, I, I, we sent an email out, and I may have made a mistake. I mean, my first mistake since I got here, but they're just kidding. <laughs> it's like my thousandth mistake. So, um, uh, what we have is on Saturday, I think we encourage you to read Matthew 5 or Matthew 5 and 6. Today, I think it says Psalms, uh, to read Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, but it's supposed to be Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 2. If you've already read Psalm, hey, it counts. I'll give you your star for reading. <laughs> but, um, but, but the reason it's Proverbs is because the Sermon on the Mount and the first nine chapters of Proverbs are really connected with the, the, the letter of James. So, the idea is we read James every single week, and then we read uh, Proverbs and, and the Sermon on the Mount. Then that will really give us a good history, historical understanding of what we're reading. Does that make sense? So if you haven't started reading or if you missed a couple of days, don't feel bad. Today is a great day to start. That's the beauty of the Lord. He gives us second chances in every single area. So my encouragement is let's continue to read as a church. And, um, and here are some of the major themes in the book of James, some of the major themes in this letter of James, uh, he, he, he talks about trials and he talks about treating people right. Today we're talking about the danger of greed. And, um, and I, 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 there's going to be a slide up on here. And then uh, next, uh, next week we're going to have uh, Rick Harville. He's uh, the Lakers chaplain or former Lakers chaplain. He's speaking on living wisely. So if you notice, we kind of switched the different themes. So he's talking about taming the tongue and things like that. So that's like the realm he's in. And I'm like, would you want to speak on this? And he said, yeah, I, I love it. And he goes, hey, he, said, he told me this. He goes, make sure the church brings their Bible because it's going to be good. I'm like, all right. So, so next week I'm excited for that. Then, then another theme is a pure heart. That's week five. Then week six of the series is the Lord will return. Say amen to that. Amen. And, uh, and then week seven, it's going to be a, a great, great passage. We're ending it with with James talks in about faith that heals and bring the elders and anoint the sick with oil and they will be healed. Like that's, we're going to really get into that. Uh, that's a powerful passage, but the Lord heals. And as always, if you missed any of the messages or, um, um, you know, you're like, ah, well, what did he say about that? Go online to our website, KaimiKeyChristian.org. You can watch the videos or you can listen to the podcast. And then you'll uh, be up to date. And we always update our, our website. So there's always good information on what's going on. And uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go to James chapter 4. And, and we're going to start with verse 13. Now last week I talked about, um, you know, kind of a little bit how the Bible came to be. Like how did we get our 66 books in our Bibles? Uh, and then what about the Apocrypha? And then how did these books get chosen? And all of that. So there was enough interest that we're going to create a series on how the Bible was built, and, and probably in two weeks we'll release it, 
probably do four or five videos, like five to eight minutes each, and then we'll, we'll, we'll release one video a day, like Monday to Friday or something like that. And, um, and so that is coming, just so you know. James chapter 4, starting with verse 13. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or to that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So we're going to talk about the arrogance of wealth. James presents really four arguments or four discussions that reveal the foolishness of us trying to live our lives on our own, not including God in, in the picture of our lives. And, and the, first, the first thought he brings up is, is the complexity of life in verse 13, the complexity of life. If you think about the complexity of life, think of everything that happens in a day. And then think about everything that happens in a week. Then think about all the relationships that you have to deal with and balance and how sometimes things get like crazy and muddy and and life is complex. And what he's telling his readers is that you're saying you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to make money here, make money there. but, But one thing you forget, you forget God in this entire picture. You forget how complex life is, and why wouldn't you want to include the creator of the universe into your big decisions, into every decision? Then he goes on to talk about verse 14a, the uncertainty of life. Now, when you're doing Bible study, when it says 14a, the a is the first part of the verse. B is the second part of the verse, and and, and so forth. But in 14a, the uncertainty of life. The audience that he's reading, that he's writing to, would plan for years. Now, James doesn't say planning is bad. He's not saying that if you're a business person, planning is bad, or if you're just anybody, planning is bad. He's not saying that at all. But they would plan for years, and they would say, because I did this planning, I'm going to make this money. I am going to um, be the one that uh, gets the credit for this. And then um, it's reminiscent of the parable of the farmer in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain later for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Or then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Then James goes on and talks about the brevity of life in verse 14b. I think the older we get, the, the more we realize life is shorter. And now that I'm the ripe age of 40, I could speak a lot to that. Woke up this morning, my back was, I'm just kidding, I've been doing that joke like all week. <laughs> I was going to bring a cane, but I'm like, no, I better not. <laughs> but, but he talks about the brevity of life and how life is short. It's like we're not promised tomorrow. We're, we're not promised tomorrow at all, but, but he tells us that life is is short. Uh, New Testament scholar Warren Wiersbe writes this, since life is so brief, we cannot afford to merely spend our lives. And we certainly do not want to waste our lives. Now here's the key. We must invest our lives in those things that are eternal. Amen. Then he goes on to say in verse 16, the frailty of life. We're not promised tomorrow, like I said, and, and, and no matter of what stage of life we're in, we don't know what's going to happen. But we have faith in God that no matter what happens, God's still in charge. 
no matter what happens, God is still on the throne. And so, so the idea, the frailty of, of life is writing to, these, to, these, to his audience, and he's saying, listen, you think you're going to do all these things, but you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And there is this arrogance behind their planning, this arrogance saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this money. I'm going to make this happen. And he's, and he's, he's presenting this powerful argument. This, this section and the one we're about to read in just a moment is, is probably one of James' most forceful thoughts in the, in, in, the book of, in the letter of James here because he's really coming down on some people, as we're going to see. And then what happens in verses 5 and 1 to 6, there's a, uh, there's a change. In verses 5, 1 to 6, he talks about the dangers of wealth. But here's what's very fascinating. James would write about, he he'd write, like, to my brothers, I say this, my brothers and sisters, like, like to my ohana, to my family. But then in verse 5, what we're going to see is he says, to the rich. All the New Testament is written to believers, whether they're mature believers or whether they're uh, new believers. They're written, it's written to believers. So is the letter of James. But it seems like there's a little shift where his main audience is the 12 tribes scattered among all the known world at the time, which we read in chapter 1. But then it's like a, like a, like a shift, like he's addressing not just the 12 tribes scattered, but yet the rich oppressors. And it's very fascinating because we don't see this in the New Testament very much. But here's, here's, a, um, what we're gonna, here's what's going on. Let's, let's, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's read verse 1 and, um, and see what's going on. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Is that interesting? It's not saying my brothers and sisters. He's not saying the followers of Jesus. It's almost like this section here is for the rich oppressors which may include believers in Jesus and which may include those who are not believers in Jesus. So now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. That that's a, sounds like a prophecy to me. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. And listen to what he says here. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you he says you rich people and so in this in these six verses here in james 1 to 6 he offers a warning and he offers an encouragement to to the readers number one his encouragement is this is 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 for them to leave judgment to god while they persevere in righteousness he's telling them that no matter what's happening judgment ultimately is the lord's then we read, uh, then he says, here's a warning. His warning is for them to beware of God's judgment. And his readers, he wants them to flee from materialistic sin themselves. And the implication here is that he's telling the people who are rich and who are powerful, who are influential, that they have a responsibility. And the responsibility is to not oppress those who are underneath them. Because what was going on in our passage is that these landowners would, would say, okay, yeah, take care of this. Yeah, take care of that. And, and, and these landowners were, uh, or, or these workers, these day workers were, were expected to be paid that day. Because they needed to feed their families. They needed to take care of their kids. They needed that money for that day. But a lot of these rich landowners, these rich oppressors, they wouldn't pay them. Sometimes they'd go weeks and, 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 and months without paying them, but yet they would come to work. And what James is doing is he's calling them out. He's like, you are oppressing people that you promised to pay. You are oppressing people, and you are bringing hurt upon them, and this should not be. And so most of James' denunciation takes the form of an Old Testament prophetic judgment oracle. And some might be saying, wow, James is pretty bold here. Does he want us to take our matters into our own hands? 
And here's the difference. The difference between his denunciation of the rich and the violent speech he himself condemns is that he appeals. Here's the key. He appeals to God's judgment rather than to human retribution. He's appealing to God's judgment rather than human retribution. And what's interesting, this prophecy that he gave was timely because several years after he wrote this, the Jewish rich were virtually obliterated because there was a big revolt against Rome. And so he writes this passage here under the inspiration of Scripture, and their destruction did come several years after he wrote this. But look at verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. The imperative to weep and to howl are a graphic, prophetic way of saying you will have reasons to weep and to howl. He's writing this to the rich oppressors, people who are abusing those under them. They have influence to help people, influence to have the responsibility to to pay what they said they're going to pay, but they're not doing it. And James very forcefully says you're going to have reasons to weep and to howl. Verse 2. Talks about clothing. Clothing was important, um, you know, was a symbol in, in antiquity. So if you had lots of clothes or colorful clothes, you were rich. The poor and the peasants who, the, who these uh, people were oppressing, the rich oppressors were uh, oppressing, they would only have one set of clothes. That's it. And verse 3, some, uh, verse 3 reminds us of Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. It says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the key again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Just let that verse sink in. Where our treasure is. That's where our heart will be. We may not be as bad as these rich oppressors, but anytime we read scripture, we got to really figure out, all right, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me? We're all in the same boat together. So listen to this verse one more time and just process this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In verse 4, the law of Moses forbade withholding wages, even overnight. If the injured worker cried out to God, the Old Testament says that God would avenge them. That was a big no-no. You did not say, I'm going to pay you, and then not take care of them, because that was their livelihood. That was the money they would buy food with, take care of their families with. And that was something that brought disdain, and, and, and that's what God did not want at all. And in verse 5, the rich consume much meat in the day of slaughter. And, and, and meat was generally only available to the rich unless there was a festival where everyone was welcome to the festival. Then the poor could have meat. But generally, if you're poor in this time frame, you would not eat meat. You would be basically a vegetarian type, type diet because you couldn't afford meat. And here's what's fascinating. The picture here. The picture here in verse 5, the picture here is of the rich being fattened like cattle for the day of their own slaughter. Is that a vivid imagery? As often in the Old Testament, the sin in verse 5 is a lavish lifestyle while others go hungry or in need. New Testament theologian and scholar Craig Keener writes that. In verse 6, to take a person's garment or to withhold a person's wages was really to risk that person's life. So James the Just, remember James the half-brother of Jesus, also known as James the Just? James the Just himself was later martyred by the high priest because he would denounce the behavior of the rich. He would step up, step up and say what you rich oppressors are doing is wrong. And he was martyred because of that. 
He's not saying you're rich and you're wrong. He's not having any issue with that. Because there are rich people who are the most generous people in the world. And there are poor people who are the most generous people in the world. He's talking about those who are rich, influential, powerful, and are oppressing those underneath them. Who are not taking care of those they said who they, whom they would pay. This is like one of those passages that's just like, there's a lot to it. But what does that mean for us today? I think a couple things. One is, let's look at our lives. Let's see where our hearts are. Let's see what we value. Do we treasure things in heaven? Do we treasure things on earth? And then I think, secondly, let's look around at the needs around us. And, and, and when we are able and have the opportunity, let's meet the needs. Maybe it's a neighbor who is struggling with something. Let's help them. Maybe it's someone you sit next to every single day in church or every single Sunday in church, every single Friday for those who come Friday at church. Maybe it's someone like that. What are the needs of those people around you? Maybe let's start there first. Some other things we could do is we got great ministries. We got Love Your Neighbor starting up, uh, coming up, and it's in your program. And that's where a group of whoever wants to go will go and clean up Common Key and, 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 and get rid of the graffiti. That's one great way of saying, you know what? I want to do what I could do. To serve, I want to do what I could do to to make things right. Uh, you know, we we have River of Life coming up. That's a great opportunity to get involved and to serve and to feed the homeless. And so, there's opportunities in your programs to get in involved there. So, check our hearts. So, where are we? Let's make sure we don't ever think we're better than anybody else because we are all sinners that are saved by grace. And 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 James here is powerfully speaking against. Um, the oppressors who are oppressing people underneath them. Then, then he, then James switches, or, or then, then after we process this, we got to ask, okay, well, how do we live? And, 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 and the, you know, the obvious answer is that we're to live generously because these rich oppressors were living selfishly. So, so the opposite of that is to live generously. And this church, our church, is one of the most generous churches. That I've been a part of, and I've been a part of so many different churches, either as an advisor or itinerant preacher or, um, you know, guest speaker, whatever, whatever the case may be. But our church is generous. And, and so when I talk about living generously, it's almost like preaching to the choir, so to speak. But, but this is the opposite of what James was talking about, and it, and it flows from this passage here. So let's talk about living generously. If you think about it, we only have so much time here on earth. We only have so much time on earth. The question is, are we going to spend all of our emotional energy, our physical energy on earthly things that matter or on heavenly things that matter? And my hope and my goal is that we continue to have this heavenly-minded mentality where we bring heaven to earth, where, where we make life here better for people in the name of the Lord. And, uh, and so living generously is more than just financial giving. Living generously is a life that says, hey, I'll come and help out. Living generously is a life that says, I'm here to serve. Living generously is, is, is the attitude that says, hey, what can I do? Or there's a need. I'm going to go and see what I could do to gather the troops and help bring the kingdom of heaven there. Living generously says, I'm not going to be stuck in the sin of greed. I'm not going to be an oppressor. I'm not going to be selfish. But instead, I'm going to be selfless. So gen living generously makes us more like God. Living generously makes us more like God. You know what? God, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. It's amazing. And then he gave the earth to Adam and Eve and says, hey, take care of it. So do it. It is yours. That is pretty generous. And then we see in John 3, 16, the greatest gift he gave us was his son Jesus, that Jesus died and that he rose again for our sins. God is a generous God. When you and I live generously, we are becoming more and more like God. He created us to be in his image, in the image of God. We are to live generously. Secondly, living generously draws us closer to God. God wants all of us. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. Matthew chapter 
6 talks about that, but uh, in, in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he says, he says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life, a person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. Let's not get our self-esteem and self-worth in what we are worth in terms of here on earth. Let's get our self-esteem and who we are and our identity that we are a child of God, that, that we love God, that he loves us. And no matter what happens on earth, we know that God is our father and we are his children. Let's have that mentality there because living generously draws us closer to God. Living generously also is the antidote to materialism. Materialism says, I, I just have to get more stuff and have more stuff and get more stuff. You know what happens when we get more stuff? We want more stuff. <laughs> we just think, if I just get this, then I'll be happy, right? If I just get this, then I'll be happy. If I just get this, you know what Jesus says? I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. He wants us to live fulfilled lives. He has put his Holy Spirit within us. God is inside of us, lives in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is generous. And when we start realizing that our significance doesn't rely on, on stuff or on materialism, we start realizing that we are to live the way God has called us to live. And when we do that, we are fulfilled. Stuff, 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 stuff does not bring happiness. A relationship with Jesus brings fulfillment and brings peace that surpasses all understanding. Living generously strengthens our faith. In all reality, you know, you think about living generously, um, you know, it doesn't really make sense, you know, to those who aren't part of, you know, who, who, who haven't accepted Jesus yet. Because we talk about we give and we give, and that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to give in every way, our times, our talents, and our treasures. These are the things that God wants us to give. Why? Because he has given us so much, and all we're doing is giving back to God what he has already given to us. And when we live generously, it strengthens our faith. For those who do give regularly and faithfully, you know the benefits and blessings that come from giving. Benefits and blessing that could not have come from any other source than from God. So living generously strengthens our faith. Living generously is an investment in eternity. I think sometimes we focus more on uh, the earthly things than, than we do on heavenly things. And I'm guilty of that as well. But, but living generously is an investment in all of eternity. So let's focus on the things that are eternal. And here's what's also fascinating with living generously, that God blesses us in return. Now, this is very crucial to understand. We don't give in order to get something back. But there is a connection between giving and God blessing us with things. The, 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 the Bible says that the generous will be blessed in Proverbs 22. The generous themselves will be blessed for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 11, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 2 Corinthians 9, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. God will bless us in return. But we don't give in order for God to bless us. And the blessings that God gives us, sometimes those blessings won't come until we meet with him for all eternity. Sometimes they will come now. Sometimes they'll come later. We don't know. But we give our times, our talent, our treasure. Why? Because these are the things that God wants us to do. Psychologist Eric Form says this, the essential difference between the unhappy, neurotic type person and the one of great joy, and here it is, is the difference between get and give. As the band comes, let's just focus on that for a moment. The difference between get and give. Our church is a generous church, and I think that's why many of God has blessed so many of us in different ways, so many different ways, because we are generous. And 
And one of the first things I noticed when, when I came on staff is that our church is generous, our, and our church continues to be generous, and God continues to bless our church. As we went through the history of our church to see what God has done in and through the history of our church and, 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 and all the ministry that has taken place all over the world because God has blessed us is amazing. So my encouragement is let's continue to be generous, church. You're already doing a great job. We're already doing a great job. Let's continue to be men and women who are generous. And back to the passage specifically here, let's remember that when tough times come, and they will come, that God is still on the throne. That maybe you're being oppressed somehow in a different way. Maybe you are being oppressed, but understand that God is on the throne, and God will fight our battles. And what I want to do is just pray because I, because there, there might be some of you here who are going through a difficult time. Maybe you're being oppressed by somebody, maybe a, a boss at work, maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, maybe a legal thing. I don't know. But I feel like there's some people here that just need God's touch. So if you would, just close your eyes. And if you want, you can open up your, your palms, hands open to receive this, this prayer, this blessing. Father, for those who are struggling, for those who are hurt, for those who feel some sort of oppression, it might even be spiritual oppression, Lord. It might be oppression from uh, somebody that they know, somebody they work for or work with. But God, I pray your peace upon them. God, I pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray for wisdom for those who need wisdom. I pray for guidance for those who need guidance. And God, I pray that in all of their actions, all of our actions would always bring you honor and glory and that you would bring us clarity on what to do, on what to say. And God, that in the end, you would be lifted up. Father, we look forward to the day of seeing you face to face and living with you for all eternity. And Father, until then, Bless us to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing. Yeah. 
be seated. You know, church, that this is uh, the moment that we remember God's love and God's forgiveness when we have the communion. But also, it make a time for us to experience God's forgiveness as we confess our sins before God and our shortcomings to the Lord and to commit and recommit our way to Him. I just please come forward and please hold into your elements until everyone is served.
Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we are no slave to fear. We are the children of you. Because of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross. And that's what we celebrate this morning. And we thank you, Jesus Christ, for that. Amen. Let's eat and partake together. Thank you, Brian, for the message. Um, this is a time for a tithe and an offering. And one of um, Brian's uh, key points for his message this morning, his message this morning, living generously. And you, the church, you have been living and giving generously every weekend. And you and I know what we keep, we lose. And what we give it to the Lord, we keep. And you know what happens? He adds interest to it. So when you give it to the Lord this morning, give it from the heart that you give it to him this morning. I just please come forward to receive a tithe and offering. All right, I have a few announcements for you this morning. VBS, Vacation Bible School, is coming up uh, July 22nd. Living, life is wild, God is good. Amen. So I, I love this time of year because all of our staff, we are going to be involved in this. We're going to do parking lots, you know, we're going to play games with the kids, you know, when they do all funny stuff with the kids. You know, I, I, I've learned every... Every VPS that me to do is my job, just do exactly what my wife tells me to do. <laughs> Don't say any word. Just, tell, just do what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> From the day first, the day one until the end of the week. All right? So please bring your kids, parents, bring your kids, your grandkids, and kids on the street, like Brian said. You know? Invite your, your, your family kids to come with you that weekend. It's going to be fun. It's going to be amazing that weekend. The other one is July 28th, uh, Kaimiki, uh, Kaimiki family. We are going to have a potluck for, um, uh, from 12, 12.30 to 5 o'clock, or no, 12.32, to celebrate the dedication to Ron and D. Uh, Hall. So please uh, stay th that date on your calendar. Uh, next week on the night, we, you are going to, to sign up right at the Friday night service and two services on Sunday. So you can sign up. Sign up sheet will be on the night next week. All right? Okay, let's all uh, stand up for our benediction this morning. If you need prayers, please come forward. There are people who are here praying for you and with you. And also, I ask you a big favor. Please pray for the University of Hawaii this week. One of their football players passed away two days ago. So play for the coaching staff, play for the players, play for, pray for the family. The family are here. They came from Samoa. Um, so please pray for them because they are a part of a community. Pray for the family. They are here. You know, um, Brian was talking about the return of Jesus Christ. And the return of Jesus Christ will make some of us here poor and some of us rich. Depending on the spiritual condition of your heart. Because that's what the Bible says. For where your heart is, then what happens? Where your treasure is, where your heart will be also. May God bless you all.